And it's, um, since I'm the last one on the stage, it's my honor to get to uh, introduce my former pastor and uh, my mentor, uh, my friend, someone who's taught me more about the gospel than probably anybody else. But let's welcome Pastor Jeff Warren to the stage. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Love you, bro. So good to be with you today, man. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. It's so good to be with you today. Uh, Wow, we're just filled with lots of emotion uh, today because we're back with a lot of people we love. We love you. We love this church. When I say church, we love the people of this church. And some of you are here and you're going, who is this old ball guy? I have no idea who this guy is. Um, It was my privilege to serve as pastor, it's been said here, but um, the Lord uh, just moved mightily in those days as he is now. It's incredible what God is doing here in this place. You know this, right? God is on the move. Praise be to God that he is at work among us. Um, You helped us raise our kids here. I mean, if I go too long, I'll start getting emotional, so we're going to have to keep pressing on. But you you have loved us well. Uh, Sam, you know this, man. Praise God. This church loves a pastor and his family as well as any church on the planet. And so thank you for the way that you're loving your pastor now. Rebecca and their, their girls, and we just praise God for you. It tore our hearts out to leave here. It's really a wild um, experience for me. I knew God was calling us. It was clear in the end that he was calling us to Dallas, and it tore our hearts out to leave here. But a friend of mine once said, to live the mission of life, you're always saying goodbye. Because you're either raising up and sending out, right, or you're going yourself. Because we're on mission in this life. And if I hadn't gone to Dallas, of course, uh, when I got there, I realized really quickly why the Lord had called me there. And uh, we've seen God do amazing things in the city and in our church. But um, if I hadn't left, ultimately, you wouldn't, you wouldn't now have the greatest pastor this church has ever had in the history with Sam Holm right here. This man. Sam. Now, immediately, he's going to say, no, 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 because I've told him that before. And um, he is the man for such a time as this right now in this place. And I praise God for you, Sam. You know how much I love you. I praise God for you. And uh, the Lord's using him mightily. And I want to tell you this. When I talk to Sam, he loves you. (laughs) He loves you so much. That's all he wants to talk about, how much he loves you. He loves this staff. He loves you, the whole church family. He loves you so much. Of course, if I hadn't left, ultimately, he wouldn't have come here. Um, Justin and Holly and their girls, how about Maddie singing today? Uh, they, they wouldn't be here. Um, praise be to God by his sovereignty. Should I keep going? Ryan, too, and their family would not be here. Okay? So from our leadership, from Park City's Baptist Church, sister church, we're on the same team. Stop. Stop. We're done. So I was figuring out what would be a good exchange because it's not, it's still, it's not. And so this morning, I called him in the hall and we've talked, Randy Moreland is coming with me to <laughs> Dallas. And uh, yeah, so I'm excited about that. Uh, love Randy. And uh, yeah, if I did that, there would be some throwing down something. <laughs> this church would fall apart perhaps. Uh, if Randy Moreland left, so praise be to God. Uh, yeah, it's great to be here, a church that has said from the foundation, back when R.C. Buckner, among others, every pastor that's been here has led the church, and you've done it. You've, you've been a church that makes disciples, and we've said it, you know, who live and love like Jesus, and I'm so thrilled to be here. Uh, you know, as, as Sam noted, you were here to, to make disciples of our neighbors and the nations. This church is a church making an impact around the world, and we're here to reach the next generation. So uh, that's what I'm going to talk about. My task today is to talk about the next generation, all right? So let me ask you this. How many, um, how many Aggies in the room? We got any Aggies in the room? <laughs> Woo! Yeah, you always know they're in the room, right? Uh, love my Aggies. Love you guys. You're a little cultic, but I love y'all. Um, a little weird, but I always know when Aggie's in the room, um, so, so y'all would know, a lot of you wouldn't know this, but um, this past week, you may have seen the news, they found some uh, skeletal remains uh, in a closet. It was in, the, in a, kind of the science building, this dark, uh, older part of the building in this closet. 
they called some paleontologists in there and um, found out it was the 1958 hide-and-seek champion <laughs> who <laughs> brother won. He won. <laughs> and in so doing, he lost <laughs> in this upside-down kingdom. Sometimes we think we're winning and we're losing. Sometimes what we think will bring life is actually bringing death. And today what I want to challenge you with this, I'm going to ask you the challenge, spoiler alert, as we, as we end this message, come into the light. Stop hiding. Stop hiding. Certain things grow in the dark, right? What? Fungus grows in the dark. Um, mushrooms grow in the dark. Algae. I mean stuff. Sin grows in the dark. And, and, and I say it often, you're only as sick as your secrets. When you come into the light, this is the upside down kingdom of God. Come into the light where all things are revealed and then transformation takes place. And today what I'm going to challenge us with is for us to stop playing hide and seek. Some of us did it this morning. I mean, we all do it in varying degrees. But we came this morning and I'll make sure I look good. I'm going to make sure I look And then I'm, I'm really, hi, brother, how are you doing? Uh, it's great to see you. Praise be to God. And I, I just screamed at my kids, been yelling at my children all the way here. And I was messed up throughout the week. I've got habitual sin in my life. I am a mess at home. I'm not, you know, whatever it is. We all bring our stuff, and then we act like we, we're all good. And in so doing, we're actually dying on the inside instead of allowing the Lord to change our hearts. And no wonder we're so anxious, right? Because a lot of us hide behind this Christian moralism thinking we got it all together or acting like we do. We know we don't. What's behind that? Well, go back to Genesis 3. And Adam and Eve, after the fall, decide they're going to play hide and seek from their creator. We all think, how crazy is that? We all do it. We all do it. As if God can't see us, doesn't know what's up. And then it's followed with three questions. The three primary questions we see, I mean, first questions from God. Where are you? And, and we know immediately. These questions aren't for him. They're for them. Where are you today? Then he says, what have you done? And he says, who told you you were naked? Who has shamed you? Implying, not me. These questions come to us today into this place. And I'm, I'm just challenging all of us to come into the light. Stop hiding, and let's come before God. And so what I want us to do, let's pray. I want to pray right now. I know your pastor often will do this. Let's stop and pray before we open his word. I want you to pray. And the prayer is this, you know, 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The Lord is seeking. He's searching. He's on this hide-and-seek mission, and he's seeking someone in this room right now, in this place, Hearing my voice, his eyes go to and fro throughout the earth. And they land into this place, and will, will he find you? That's the question. Will you be found by him today? And I want you to do this with eyes closed and heads bowed. If you want to say, Lord, I'm, I'm coming into the light. Find me. Find me. Speak to me. I want you to raise your hand just right where you are, just because you're doing it to, for the Lord. Lord, right near, here I am. I'm sitting right here. Speak to me. I'm here. Find me. And you can put your hand down. He says that he's looking for those whose hearts will be fully committed to him so that he might strengthen us and fill us up and transform our hearts. That we might really live in the way that he's called us to live. Will you be found by him? Lord, find us. Find me. I pray you'll speak to us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, go ahead and grab your Bible, and we're going to be in Psalm 78. Now, I'm going to do this. I want us to uh, focus on one single verse today. So I'll be jumping around a little bit. If you want to jump around with me to some other text, we'll put it on the screen, of course. But what I want us to do is, and while you're turning there, I want us to focus in on Psalm 78. Your pastor has unpacked this, um, this whole passage, by the way, so well a couple weeks ago. This is the theme verse, really, for the celebration of the 150 years. And we're going to look at it again today. 
So let's do this in honor of God's word. Let's stand. Let's stand and let's read it together out loud, proclaiming the word of God over us right now. Let's do it. Proclaim it boldly. We will not hide them from their children, but tell the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Praise be to God. This is his word for us. You may be seated. So James Montgomery Boyce um, is a commentator. He says that Psalm 78 is the longest of the historical psalms. Didn't know if you, you knew there was a category called that. They're, they're psalms that, that basically tell of the redemptive story of God, what he's been doing. And, and, and in this, as we often, he tells us all the time, remember, remember, because we're prone to forget. And he says, remember what I've done. And then uh, Boyce writes this. Its lesson is that history must not repeat itself. The people must never again be unbelieving. And the whole psalm is this command to remember and proclaim what God has done to the next generation. This verse alone will help us answer three questions. We'll serve it and it'll catapult us into other places in Scripture because a lot has happened since the first hearers of this word, first readers. This is Asaph, the worship leader, who, who shares this with us. But there are three questions I want to look at today. What are we hiding it says we're hiding something. We're not going to hide. What, what are we hiding? How do we hide it? And then uh, how do we find it? Okay, so if you take notes on sermons, that's how we're going to break it down. First, what are we hiding here? What are we hiding? And I'll go ahead and, and say it. We're, we're, we're prone to hide the explicit gospel. We're prone to get off course away from what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Look at the verse again. We will not hide them. What is them? Well, he qualifies it. Look at this. It's stated. The glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Again, a lot has happened since this verse. It goes on in verse 7. It says, so that they should set their hope in God. Now, let's, let's use this as a springboard into this cultural moment. Okay? As we talk about this generation, as we talk about the next generation. We live in a generation that has forgotten God. We live in a generation that that has placed God on the shelf. Now, you may be here today and say, not, not me, not us, not in my circle of friends, not my family, praise be to God. But there's a recent study that was done in 2021, the American Worldview Inventory, the participants surveyed, embraced the modern notion, postmodern, really, notion that all truth is subjective. 54% of all Americans... Now, I checked this out. I was like, okay, is this for real? More recently, Gallup Poll had a, had a survey. More than 50% of Americans, and I saw another study, 58% of all Americans say there is no moral absolute. Truth is relative. There's no authority outside of ourselves to tell us what is right or wrong. It's your truth up against my truth. Now, this is not new to you, right? This has been coming for a long, long time, but the first time ever in our nation... More than 50% of, of all people say there's no absolute authority outside of ourselves. The, the, listen, a post-truth culture is by definition a post-Christian culture. That's where we're heading. I'm not here to scare you. I'm here to challenge us because, watch this, as things get darker, the light shines brighter. You know this, right? As things get darker, the light shines brighter. We live in a post-truth culture. Carl Truman wrote a book called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And in it, the subtitle is Cultural Amnesia, Expressive Individualism, and the Road to, sex to the Sexual Revolution. And in it, he lays out a history of how we got to this place where now your personal preference is stated as a truth claim. Your preference up against mine. Your truth, my truth. There's no outside authority of truth. So where does it come from? You're, you determine truth for you, right? And this is where we are. In another great book called You Are Not Your Own, Alan Noble quotes Jean-Paul Sartre, the great French philosopher, um, who said, if there's no outside authority for us, if there's no moral standard outside of the individual, and he, he's an atheist. He was an atheist, by the way. If there's no moral authority over us, he says, man is damned to be free. 
condemned to be free. And here's what he means. Now you're destined to figure out your identity. You decide what your meaning of life is. You determine what the purpose of this life is. You, you decide what it is to live a life that's actu- that actually means something. And here's an atheist who goes like every smart atheist goes. He says, without a God, life has no meaning at all, no purpose, unless you discover it yourself. And then he goes on to say this. This is the recipe for a life that is filled with anxiety. Think about it. It's hard to be God. Isn't it interesting? When we think of Gen Z in particular, of all the descriptors that people use, the anxious generation. That's not just Gen Z. We decide that there is no God, there's no more, as that's on the rise, anxiety on the rise. I believe those two things are linked because we need to turn back to the one who's created us because here it is, here it is, here's what happens. You, if without God, and we all do this. Listen, we're not throwing rocks at everybody outside of this place. We all are prone to do this. What we do, we forget God. We, 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 we can live. We can, we can live as essential, functional atheist. When we say believe in God, love God, love God, not even allow him to control our lives. We can do the same. And, and here's what happens. We all seek to justify our lives. That's the word. We seek to validate our lives, right? By our good works, by, by the money we make, by our job, by, you know, got it together, my family got it together. No, we don't, but look at, look at us. And look, at, I can validate myself on social media. Look at me, look at me living my best life now. I am dying inside. We're seeking to justify, to validate ourselves, and we'll do whatever it takes to do so. But when we eliminate the answer before we start the problem, it always leads to absurdity. If there is no number four, think think with me. No number four. What's two plus two? There's a brother who believes. See, he has faith. (laughs) He knows about standard, about absolute truth, right? There's no number four, so what, hmm... Five minus one, ten minus six, what? No, that's absurd. And we've eliminated God, and we're prone to do the same, even in our Christian lives. Because the world says, you pull together a group of people here in Collin County and say, um, hey, tell us, how can you experience happiness? Most of them would say freedom, freedom, that I can do whatever I want to do. And friends, listen. The truth of Scripture is not not freedom is whatever you want to do. Freedom is doing what you ought to do. Oughtness demands that there is some authority, some moral standard by which we're to live. God's Word is just that for us, right? His Spirit leading us. Because if you can't do what you ought to do, that's not freedom, that's bondage. And that's what's happened in our world. Because we do not take into account what the Bible calls sin. Give me over to whatever I want to do, I will self-destruct. Sin by its nature is self-destructive. God created all things good and beautiful. In our free will, we chose against him. We sought to justify ourselves apart from him. And so we turned away from him. And you and I are in desperate need of rescue. And so God sends his son, Jesus to live the perfect life for us, dies on the cross for us so that we could receive by faith, not by works. He justifies us before a holy God. We receive that as a gift of grace, and we live in that. And we, we, we seek to understand it. We want to live in it. No longer do we need to validate ourselves. We've been justified. We sang about it earlier, right? But, but don't miss this. Irreligious people... And religious people seek to continue to justify themselves. Martin Luther, the great reformer, said the default mode of the human heart is the law. We always go back to the law. Whether saved or not, we constantly go back to justify ourselves. And we've got to continue to be discipled out of that. How do you do that? We're going to talk about it today. What what are we hiding? 
in our lives, I think we're hiding, and in the world, we're hiding the explicit gospel. And I'll talk about how we, we do that in a moment. But, but some of us seek the way of the younger brother in the prodigal son story. You know, the irreligious. I'm a, I, freedom, that's what I want. And we know where that goes, right? We see it. But then you've got the dutiful older brother who stays home. He's dutiful. You can say he's religious. He's doing all the things. And he's miserable. And he won't join the party. Neither of them want the father. The gospel is not the way of the irreligious. It's not the way of the religious. It's something altogether different. The gospel is always the third way. It's another way. And we've got to understand it or we'll never experience this freedom. We'll never share the explicit gospel. You need to hear this again today. Religion says, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. Grace says, I'm accepted, therefore I obey. Always in response to what Christ has done. Romans 5.1, Paul says it this way. Therefore, since we have been justified. Everybody say justified. <laughs> Thank you. Justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. To the degree that you're not experiencing peace in your life today is the same degree to which you don't keep running back to this truth. You've been justified. This gospel message cannot be hidden. We've been saved by grace through faith. It's not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. It's all about what Christ has done for us. And I love this. Perhaps you've heard that justified means, uh, you could define it this way, just as if I'd, what? Never sinned. It's a great definition. Remember that. Maybe even better, I've come to understand with church folk like me, just as if I'd always obeyed. Listen to me. Young people, listen to this. Your past does not define you. Because of the great exchange You've been justified, which means that he has taken his righteous record, perfect record, and he's exchanged it for your bankrupt, sinful, hell-bound record. Paul says in Romans that there has been an account. In Galatians, he says, we've shifted the account. Now his account stands for your account. He's filled it up with his righteousness. Your sin has been taken upon him on the cross. And now you have been made right before God Almighty. You're defined by Jesus' past. Listen, his past is perfect. That's who you are if you're in him. If you've not received his grace, if you have by faith received his grace, friend, you are still condemned in your sin, hell-bound apart from God. But if you will receive his grace, you understand, I've been justified. This is the pearl of great price. I have now the treasure. Everything else is garbage. What we need is this expulsive power of a new affection. Something that so dominates our passion and our response, nothing else matters. It's what Paul says in Philippians 3. He says, I count everything, the most religious man who ever lived, you could argue. Everything I've done, it's all garbage. And I'm willing to lose it all because of the surpassing knowledge, the worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them as rubbish, garbage, in order that I may gain Christ. I'm going to be found in him. There it is. Found in him. Covered in his righteousness. Not a righteousness of my own, but his righteousness that has come and covered me by faith. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. And some of us say, oh, faith. Oh, that's so hard. Praise God it's faith. You're not smart enough to get to him. You're not good enough, and you never will be. The Christian faith is not work harder, get better. The Christian faith is believe more deeply in what Christ has already accomplished for you. That is it. Lord, give us faith. He even gives us a gift of faith. This is the Christian message. You have been justified by faith. Jesus did not come to simply be your good example. He came to be your perfect substitute. Those are two very different things. And there's a lot of Christians who don't understand it. We're hiding the gospel from others because we've not yet grasped it. Not fully, and we don't live in it. You've got to recalibrate everything back to the grace of God, 
That's what transforms our lives. So a, a verse on repeat, when I was here as pastor and in my life, God made him, this is my life verse, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. In order that, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The old Living Translation, I love it. It says, Living Bible says, he took our sin and he poured it into himself. He took his righteousness and he poured it into us. Totally forgiven. Completely loved. Then everything in life is a response to that. What are we hiding? We're hiding the gospel because we need to continue to get underneath it. Your pastor explains this. He, he preaches the word as, any, as well as anybody I know on the planet. Constantly bringing this back to, I know Justin and Holly, all of your leaders here, let's get back to grace, back to grace. Because we never move past grace. You never graduate to deeper things. Let's keep getting underneath the gospel. So how do we hide it? You say, Jim, I'm, I'm not hiding that, and yet, yet we all are. We're convicted, right? We're, we're hearing this. Look at what it says. It says, we will not hide them from their children. Wait, hide? How, how are we hiding them? But we will tell them. Okay, look at this. As he qualifies, what is them? What is, it, what is this we're hiding? The glorious deeds of the Lord. And, and again, a lot has happened since this passage. The, Jesus has come. The resurrection. You talk about glory of the cross and resurrection. And when we believe and receive the gift of his grace, we're justified. Then we commit ourselves, listen, to being sanctified. Here's what happens. How do we hide it when we've not made a resolve, a commitment to become just like Jesus? That's the problem. We got people who claim to be Christian who don't live anything like Jesus. We're seeing this in the public square. We're, seeing, we're, we're thinking that, well, I got my doctrine straight, and you don't live anything like Jesus. I, I've got all the things I'm convicted about. I'm going to blast it on Facebook, in fact. That would be a great thing. I'm just going to tell everybody what's up. I'm going to dive even into my, my, my political views and such, and I'm going to proclaim it because that's where the kingdom is going to come, through politics. I'm going to be there, and we're going to do this thing, and we act nothing like Jesus in the process. You can have your theology right and be totally wrong. David French, probably my favorite um, cultural commentator these days, he says what has happened is, uh, I'll paraphrase, he says, we now have become convinced, bold in our convictions, our partisan ways are non-negotiable, and we'll proclaim them as such. But when it comes to the way of Jesus, fruit of the Spirit, negotiable. And we're losing We've got to redefine what the win is, friends. Are we seeking to win arguments? Are we seeking to win debates? Or, sorry, are we seeking to win elections? Or are we seeking to win souls to Jesus? Because Jesus Christ did not come to take sides. He came to take over. He's not up for election because he is Lord already. And those who will proclaim him as Lord are the ones who will change the world. That's where it's happening. I'm not saying all these things in our culture don't matter. But you've got to make a decision, friends. Have you? Here's my, here's my question. Have you decided? Having been justified, if you have been, big question, if you have been. If you've been justified, have you made a conscious, intentional decision to be sanctified? Theologian Richard Lovelace puts it this way. He writes, only a fraction of the present body of professing Christians are solidly appropriating the justifying work of Christ in their lives. This is our problem. This is how we hide it. In their day-to-day existence, they rely on their, watch this, sanctification for justification. Few know enough to start each day with the thoroughgoing stand upon Luther's platform, the great reformer, You are accepted, looking outward in faith, and claiming the holy, completely alien righteousness of Christ as the only ground for acceptance. Relaxing, I love that, having be at peace in that quality of trust, which will produce then increasing sanctification 
as faith is active in love and gratitude. Justification, here's what he's saying. Justification is the finished work of Jesus. When you receive, when, you're, when you come to Christ, you're completely justified. It's a one-time thing. It, it's, it's one-way love, unilateral, unilateral grace that comes to you. You do nothing for it. Justification is the objective, unchanging position that you now have in Christ. Sanctification is becoming like Jesus in response to the grace of God that's changed your life. You see, sanctification is, is progressive, right? Beginning at the moment you're justified, and then you determine that I'm going to be just like Christ. These two doctrines cannot be separated. And that's the problem in our culture. We hide the truth and the glory of the gospel because we think, I'm saved, I did the thing, I walked down the aisle, whatever, it, I was baptized, and maybe it was real. But you have not made a conscious decision to wake up every day, here it is, the passion of your life is to be just like Jesus. That's what it means to be a disciple. It, it means that you're going to look like him, you're going to act like him have you made a conscious decision and will you every day will you today for the rest of your life i'm going to be an apprentice of jesus that's the passion of my life it's the one thing i mean i got a job i got family i got i got all this stuff but here's the question now once you know what god has done in christ what he's done then you ask the question what would jesus do that's how you live the life of a disciple. What would Jesus say to my spouse in this situation? What would Jesus say to my friends in this group of friends? How would Jesus act if he were sitting in my desk in this classroom? What would Jesus be like if he was walking down the hall in my school? What would Jesus be like if he, if he was actually in my position in the workplace? What I do? How would he live his life? How would Jesus live in my house what would it be like towards my neighbors? And can I say it? What would Jesus be like with people that I know that make me crazy because they don't have the same partisan views that I have? What would he be like? Would he respond the moment that you see whether they're Republican or Democrat? Would he say, would he respond with hatred and disdain? Or would he respond with grace and love and kindness? Okay, we're losing the culture wars. Because we claim to follow Jesus, and we don't look like him much at all. I realize I'm probably preaching to the proverbial choir, but may it convict us. We've got to decide what's the win. And this church has decided the win, the win is to reach souls for Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And your pastor is keeping you white hot focused on that because he is Lord He's the one who changes lives. And if we come to think that my convictions and what is true is non-negotiable, but the way of Jesus and the fruit of the Spirit is negotiable, we think we're winning, we're losing. Because Jesus is perfect theology. And so we follow the way of Jesus, or friends, listen, we have become the clanging clong, clong, clongs the, that, thank you, we become, we become the symbols, uh, the noise, right, that Paul warned us about. So, here's the question your pastor will want to ask you today. I think, who are you discipling? Who are you discipling? Because, you know, oh, we exist to make disciples. We are making disciples as if there's some machine. The church is something. We got programs. And stuff, and we spit out disciples on the other end of this thing. No, 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 you are the church. Who are you discipling? Because disciples make disciples. So I'll land with this. How do we find it? I've already talked quite a bit about that. How do we find it? It says again in, in verse 4, but tell the coming generation. We, we find it when we tell. We find it when we understand it, when we live in it, and when we tell it. And Jesus said it's possible to hide it. He says in Matthew 5 that, that it's possible for us to, to not share the gospel, but instead hide it under a bowl, right? Under a bushel. 
And he says, instead, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before everyone else. And so we're calling you today, just calling you back to the great commission that this church was founded on. It's the sermon you hear all the time. It's what the staff and your pastor are leading you to all the time. And in it, Jesus says, there's one main verb there, go and make disciples. The syntax of the Greek is such, make disciples is the imperative. How do we do that? There's these qualifying participles. By going intentionally, by baptizing, which means you're sharing the gospel and people are coming to faith, proclaiming their faith, by entering into covenant relationship with the church family. This is a word for some of you today. You need to join this church today. And then by teaching them everything I've commanded you to become just like Jesus. And that's what this church, praise be to God, is all about. And so Jesus says to us in John 12, 46, I have come into the world as light so that no one who believes in me should stay in darkness. Friends, I'm asking you come into the light. Come out. Come out today and say, Lord, here I am. You found me. You found me. You found me. And I want us to do, let's just pray. I want to pray. Just close your eyes and let's enter into this holy moment as, as we finish. And let the Lord speak into your heart. How is, what, how is he calling you? What are you going to do? What are you going to do? If you've never received his grace, you can be justified. You can stop trying to justify yourself. And you can be justified forever. Receive his grace now to say, yes, Jesus, come into my heart. I'm sorry for how I've turned from you. I turn to you and I give you my life. I receive your grace. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. And if, if you know that you know that you have prayed that prayer, that you have committed your life to Christ, what are you going to do today? Now that you don't need to do a thing, what will you do? How do you need to come into the light? Some of you need to join this church. Some of you need to be baptized. Some of you need to decide that you're going to be just like Jesus. You're going to make a commitment today. That's it for a lot of us here. You're going to wake up every day and say, I'm going to be like Jesus today. So Lord, walk with me. Remind me of your grace. And everything I do then is in response to that. So, Lord, thank you for this great church. And as we set up for the next 150 years, we know this is our time. So we come into the light because you are our rescue. You are our hope. You are our Savior and our Lord. In whose name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Praise be to God. Thank you for joining us today for Worship Online. If you're in our area, we want to invite you to come to physically connect to your local church. We would love to help you to live and love like Jesus alongside of others who are doing the same. If you're from outside of our area, can I challenge you to find a local church in your area that's going to preach the Bible and exalt Jesus? Smash the like button, subscribe, share with friends, and turn on notifications if you'd like to stay up to date with us. And thanks again for joining us.